if you remember in the space of Z in the latent space, you could do arithmetics like add and subtract, etc. You could take one image, take another image, look at their corresponding Zs, do an interpolation in that space and make somebody who is angry to be happy, okay, by interpolating between the Zs of those two images. But the problem is, if you pick a dimension in your Z, let's say Z is 100 dimensional and you pick the 10th dimension, the 10th, the 10th element, and you change that, you want to associate meaning to that entry of your latent vector. You want to now associate meanings. Previously, they didn't have any meaning. Only when you were interpolating, you would see some meaning. Okay, now you want every element or every dimension of your latent space to have a meaning. What do I mean? Let's say you have a categorical variable, C1. So these are your latent variables. You have a categorical variable, which is simply a uniform distribution. It is uniformly distributed between 10 numbers from zero to nine. This is C1 and you have to uniform from negative one to one. And now you want these to have meanings. What do I mean by meaning? If you change C1, if you generate a sample from it and you push it through your neural network, you want it to generate different numbers, zero, one, two. So this is different from conditional GANs. So please don't confuse it with that. Now you're trying to associate meaning to these latent variables. And the method that this paper is advocating is called InfoGAN. If you use that and you keep generating samples from C1, you're gonna see different numbers. And these are just being sorted by the authors. So don't worry about the sorting, but as you keep generating samples, you're gonna see different numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So now C1 has a meaning associated to, the, to it. If you do the same thing on a regular GAN, you're not gonna have any clear meaning. Sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's zero, etc. So the behavior is random. If you look at C2 and you keep varying it from negative two to two, so you're going beyond the boundaries of the uniform, but that's a minor detail. You can see that uh, C2 is corresponding to, to the rotation of the digits. If you vary C3, you can see that it corresponds to the width of your handwriting. So it becomes wider. But how do you do that? How do you associate meaning to latent variables? And this is what is called disentangled representation. So each element or each dimension of your hidden variable is gonna have a meaning. It's gonna have a meaning associated to, the, to it. It's gonna have semantics. And these are disentangled. So you don't have to look at a linear combination of your latent space like what we were doing before with the uh, interpolation between two Zs, two vectors. You can, uh, for instance, change the disentangle, the writing style from the digit shape. You can disentang disentangle pose from lighting of 3D rendered images. You can disentangle background images, background digits from the street view house number. So this is a data set by Google. You can, uh, explore it and these are images that are taken from house numbers and these are colored images unlike MNIST and you can disentangle hairstyle from presence or absence of eyeglasses or emotions in celeb A and celeb A is also a famous data for GANs for generative models and these are the faces of celebrities as the name suggests so let's take a look at regular GAN this is the objective for a regular GAN you have a discriminator discriminating between data and noise. And noise is basically your generated images. If you take a noise, you push it through G, you're gonna get a generated image. What is InfoGAN trying to do? You have that objective still, you have the objective of a regular GAN, but now you want your latent variables, these Cs that you just saw here, C1, C2, C3, if you put them in a vector, you want them to have meaning. It means that if you take C, you push it through your generator, that should give you a lot of information about C. So you don't want C to disappear. You don't want the meaning of C to go away. So you're minimizing G, you're minimizing with respect to G. It means that you are maximizing this I. And because of this negative sign, you are maximizing this I. But what is that I? And what is Z first? Z is a source of incompressible noise. So you, you are not gonna be able to control it. So they are gonna be 
entangled. So some part of your latent space is going to be entangled and there is no way for you to associate meaning to it. So this is for your model to be a little bit free. And then for Cs, you want to have this entangled meaning. You want C1 to have a different meaning than C2, than C3, than CL. And these are your latent codes. These have semantic meaning, semantic features of your data. And what is I? This is the mutual information between two random variables. This is one random variable, this is another random variable. And you want the mutual information between C and G to be high. What do I mean? And what is the mutual information? It's the amount of information that you're gonna learn from a random variable, in this case, Y, about the other random variable. Basically, if Y is independent from X, you're not gonna learn anything out of knowing Y. If you know Y, it's not gonna help you reduce the entropy of X, okay? So you want the mutual information between these two to be high. You don't want C to disappear, the meaning of C. This is what is gonna happen. The information or the mutual information between X and Y is the entropy of X minus the entropy of X if you know Y. Basically, if Y is independent from X, it's not gonna reduce the entropy in any fashion. So this is gonna be H of X, H of X minus H of X is zero. So the minimum information, mutual information is zero, the minimum value for it. And then it can go higher, okay? So you want to maximize that. But there is a catch. This is beautiful mathematically, but there is a catch. If you want to compute this guy, you need to have access to the posterior because look at here, your conditioning, okay? So you need to have access to the posterior distribution. But this is not a big problem. We saw it when we were doing variational autoencoders. If you need to have access to a posterior distribution and your posterior is intractable, just approximate it with a variational distribution. So you're gonna, variation, you're gonna put a variational distribution that has the same format as your posterior. It takes X as an input and it's gonna give you C. And this is some auxiliary distribution for you to help you approximate P. Okay, perfect. Then you do some math. And then you can write down the same way that you wrote, you wrote down a lower bound to your log probability or log likelihood. You can have a lower bound. Some simple arithmetic is going to give you that on the information. And you remember, you want to maximize I. If you have a lower bound, you can maximize the lower bound. Now your lower bound depends on the prior distribution that you choose for C. And these were the prior distributions that you were choosing. We were choosing C1 to be categorical. We were choosing C2 and C3 to be uniform. This is an assumption that we are making, okay? And this is coming out of the generator. You take Z, this is from a normal distribution. This is incompressible noise. You concatenate it with this vector that you just sampled from your prior distribution. You push them through your generator. That's gonna give you an image. Once you have the image, you know Q, you, know Q, you parameterized it with a neural network, and then you also have that entropy here of C. Okay, this is your variational lower bound. Now you're gonna maximize this. Okay, perfect. Now you're gonna replace I by this lower bound, change your ob objective function. Now, not only you need to minimize with respect to G and maximize with respect to D, you are gonna minimize with respect to Q. If you minimize with respect to Q, you are maximizing this lower bound. And if you maximize the lower bound, you're maximizing the information, the mutual information. Okay, perfect. Now you can apply it on different data sets. This is the 3D rendered images. You can play around with the rotation. You can play around with the width of the chair on another data set. You can play around with the hairstyle. So you are changing the hairstyle and you can change the emotion from sad to happy. Now you're only changing one variable at a time. So one entry of your C, maybe you pick C5 and you're changing C5 to give you different hairstyles. Okay, is everything clear? Can I ask you a question? Sure. These, uh, these C variables, um, we choose the distribution beforehand, but the, is, is it correct in thinking the network will decide which variables encode what information? And then we have to go back and figure out what that was. Yes. So what you are controlling is that you want this entangled information 
you want C2 and C3 to have different meanings, but then you don't have any control over what meaning. You're absolutely right. Okay, thanks. Maybe suddenly if you do another round of training, C2 and C3 are gonna have the opposite behavior, okay? But you're absolutely right. Any other questions? Um, this Z only appears in the formulation of the problem, right? Because uh, we sample our C and then we feed that into the network. Yes. So you sample Z and you sample the C and you push it through your generate to give you fake images. Oh, so these are two separate. What's Z specifically? Is it a vector? Yes. This it's You can think of it like Z. It's the same thing as Z, but now Z has no meaning. It, it is entangled, the meaning between its entries. But C, it's a Z that has a meaning. It's Vector, each entry has a meaning. Does that make sense? Well, I guess my question is, um, do you, you just feed C into the network, right? So you sample C and then you just feed C into the network because I see this Z appearing in the formulation as well. So no, you sample both of them. You sample a Z, you sample a C, you push them through your network to give you images. And okay. Z is just like random noise. Yes, so Z is random noise. C is also noise, which has meaning. This is meaningful noise. This is meaningless noise. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Actually, it has a meaning. Z also has meanings, but we cannot interpret its entries. Okay. Any um, this, reminds, this reminds me a little bit of principal component analysis with images, where you can then like, or with any data set. Um, but is there similar uh, decay on the amount of usefulness with? In this case, they did like two values for C, and what if they had tried three or four? or five or so on. And like, how, how do the, um, the increase in the number of C values decrease the amount of information or the amount of control that you get from each variable? I think these are great questions, actually. What happens if you increase the size of C? Are you gonna reduce the meaning that comes out of each element individually? These are great questions and I don't think the paper is answering them, okay? Maybe we can do a research on that, but I don't know the answer, but you are right. Maybe if you add, increase the dimension of C, basically increase L, are you going to lose meaning or what's going to happen? So no, these are not studied in the paper. Okay. Cool. And the, the other critique or criticism is why are you putting a 10 here? What happens if you put 11? Okay. These sorts of questions are important and they are not answered in the paper. So the paper is brilliant. This idea is brilliant, but there is still room for improvement.